introduce our speaker. Christina Barclay is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Calgary. She joined the Miopar uh, Ocean Acidification COP in October 2020 as their new coordinator. She received her PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Alberta, where she studied the effects of ocean acidification on marine snails and their relationships with shell crushing crab predators through time. Christina hopes to bring her background in OA research and science outreach communication to continue to mobilize and engage the Miopar OA COP. So once again, everyone, welcome to Ocean Canada's Ocean Acidification Community of Practice webinar and take it away, Christina. All right, awesome. Can everybody hear me? I think it, we're good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Allison, for that introduction, and thank you very much to Neopar for um, hosting today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an update, a little bit of information on our ocean acidification community of practice here in Canada. Um, but before I get going, I would just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I am speaking today from the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Satina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Re Nation um, of Alberta, region number three. All right, so with that, I'll get going. All right, so for those of you who aren't familiar with ocean acidification, it's sometimes referred to as the other CO2 problem. So it's the other side effect of having increased carbon dioxide emissions. And what happens with these carbon dioxide emissions is as, as they've increased over time, about 25 to 30% of those emissions are actually absorbed by the oceans. And so there's this complex chemical reaction that occurs. And then what happens is that we, uh, one of the end products of that chemical equation is that we have an increase in hydrogen ions in seawater. And what that does is that decreases our ocean's pH. So as emissions increase from carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions increase, pH goes down, hence ocean acidification. And one of the consequences of this increase in hydrogen ions is not only that we're having more acidic waters, but hydrogen ions bond really readily with carbonate that's naturally found in seawater. And so this is um, a really important building block. Carbon, um, yeah, carbonates are a really important building block for our shell building organisms, so calcium carbonate. Um, so when we have the extra hydrogen ions, less carbonate available, it decreases our carbonate saturation states and these shell building organisms have less material available for them and they become more vulnerable. So we're actually starting to see mass mortality events of shellfish on the west coast that may be linked to things like climate change in OA. Um, we're seeing this in the United States um, and um, as well as Canada. Um, so here's just a, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this at this point, um, <laughs> but for those of you that maybe are joining us from outside of Canada, here's a map of Canada. And I just kind of want to touch on some of the unique challenges that we face in Canada in terms of ocean acidification. So this little map here, we've got these three bodies of uh, connected oceans here. So we've got the Pacific, Arctic, and Atlantic Ocean that each have unique properties. But then we also have other bodies of water like the Gulf of St. Lawrence as well as the Labrador Sea that all have these unique prob uh, properties that are affected by ocean acidification in different ways. And so I just want to take the time to show you this really great video um, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, so DFO. Um, it's got some really nice graphics and a little bit of background about some of the things that we face in Canada in terms of ocean acidification. So I'm going to go ahead and show this video. It's about three minutes long. Hold on a second. If I can get my mouse to cooperate. Since the Industrial Revolution, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have continued to increase from human activities. About a quarter of these emissions enter the oceans, which dissolve and react with water. This chemical reaction creates carbonic acid, which lowers the pH of the ocean, making it more acidic and reducing the availability of shell building materials. This process is called ocean acidification, or OA for short. 
Worldwide, OA affects ecosystems and the communities that rely on the ocean for livelihoods. As atmospheric CO2 continues to increase, so will OA, especially in colder oceans. The effects of OA are felt by many marine organisms. Ocean acidification reduces how much carbonate ion is available for shell formation. It can also cause a range of biological effects. Some species may thrive in a more acidic environment, while others may adapt over time by changing their diets or moving to more favorable environments. Some populations may decline or disappear. When small species that form the basis of food webs are affected by OA, then the whole food web can be affected. Canada's cold oceans are vulnerable to the impacts of OA because gases such as CO2 are absorbed more easily in colder waters. OA is taking place in all three of Canada's oceans. There are conditions in each region which further contribute to OA. Seasonal upwelling or the mixing of deep and surface water in the Pacific increases OA. Increased ice melt from glaciers and decreasing sea ice from warming temperatures in the Arctic cause OA to happen more quickly in the Atlantic. OA is influenced by the flow from the Arctic. Uptakes of large amounts of CO2 in the Labrador Sea caused by deep mixing and a combination of surface freshwater inputs and low oxygen seawater at the bottom of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Fisheries and Oceans Canada scientists monitor and study changing ocean conditions such as ocean acidification and conduct research to understand its effects on Canada's fisheries and ecosystems. This contributes to increasing global knowledge on OA. To learn more about ocean acidification and the important work DFO is doing, please. So I'm just going to pause the video right there that um, and I'll drop the link in the chat here in just a second. Um, Visit www. I'll try to anyways, I'll drop it in uh, later. This link um, is actually a little bit outdated. Um, but yeah, so I just thought that's a really nice summary um, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada with some really nice graphics. Um, and that video you can find on our website as well as DFO's, DFO dash. DFO's website. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, just to recap some of the things on that video, just some of the take home messages um, is that one of the unique challenges we face in Canada is that we do have the largest coastline of any country in the world. So it's a lot to manage and to monitor for things like ocean acidification. As well, they mentioned the vulnerable Arctic due to freshwater input from melting sea ice, for example. Uh, the Atlantic, or sorry, the Pacific is also vulnerable uh, just naturally due to seasonal upwelling that occurs. So seasonal upwelling basically has these cold, deep, acidic waters that are brought to the surface, and then that's exacerbated by the effects of ocean acidification. Um, we're also naturally vulnerable just due to our high latitude. Uh, colder waters actually are uh, more soluble or carbonates are more soluble in colder waters. So that actually decreases naturally our carbonate saturation states in these higher latitudes with colder waters. And as well, uh, we have a lot of coastlines. So there's a lot of coastal communities that are vulnerable, especially those in, for example, Atlantic regions that are dependent on aquaculture and fisheries. So I just like to take a couple minutes to talk about who we are, or how we fit into MEOPAR. So we are the MEOPAR Ocean Acidification Community of Practice. So we are funded by MEOPAR and we are only one of the many communities of practice within MEOPAR. So these communities of practice are all part of the knowledge mobilization and integration initiatives of MEOPAR. So that's the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network here in Canada. And these knowledge mobilization and integration initiatives, these COPs, are the goals here are to connect these interdisciplinary groups that are focused on a common issue. So in our case, it's ocean acidification. The other goals are to foster best practices for research collection if we're involving um, external stakeholders and community science in particular. Um, the other thing too is to identify national knowledge gaps in areas for growth in terms of research and monitoring. Um, so our community of practice uh, was initiated in 2018. So we're quite a young group, about two, two and a half years at this point. Um, so 
the first thing that was done was that we brought on two co-leads. Miopar brought on two co-leads, one from um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, so from DFO government, and the other is from um, academia. And then later in the year, uh, an interdisciplinary steering committee was formed um, with a wide range of expertise to help guide OACOP activities. And then later in the fall of 2018, a coordinator position was created and a coordinator was hired to be the sort of the coordinator and the facilitator, that boots on the ground person who can dedicate their time to OA community of practice activities. So I'm the second of the two coordinators or uh, yeah, there's been two of us. So our overarching goals as a community of practice here are to coordinate across all sectors, disciplines and regions with the goal of sharing expertise and data related to ocean acidification. Um, one of our other main goals is to identify pressing needs for OA research and knowledge. And then finally, we are, our goals are to create this collaborative and supportive environment for groups affected by OA. So really bringing in all these various stakeholders from different areas and trying to really foster that sense of community and communication between anyone who might be interested or affected by ocean acidification in Canada. Uh, we have specific terms of reference that we use as sort of our guiding principles and um, calls to action for the community of practice. So first of all, our, one of our main goals is to develop linkages between end users and creators of ocean acidification data. So in particular, connections between research and industry, for example. Um, another thing that we are working towards is developing best practices for research and data collection. Um, this is really important for building community science data gathering initiatives, because um, it can be a little bit complex to um, collect some of these samples. They require um, handling of dangerous materials. Um, so it's really important for us to have a good set of best practices that we can share with our community. We're also uh, developing uh, data sharing networks and standards uh, with other groups within Canada and beyond and making sure that the data that we do produce and that is produced in Canada is accessible. We're also developing regional hubs for ocean acidification research activities. So we do recognize that, you know, we are a very large country and someone's concerns in the Pacific might not be the same as the concerns uh, of someone in the Arctic regions, for example. So having a little bit more regional activities that are a little more focused is really helpful. And then finally, another thing we're doing is developing a list of ongoing OA research and infrastructure. And I'll touch a little bit more about that in a second. So I just wanted to highlight here our leadership team, just so you can get a sense of how interdisciplinary uh, we are and how well-rounded this team is. So as I mentioned, we have uh, the first two people brought on were our two co-leads. So we've got Brent Els from the University of Calgary. He's an associate professor and he specializes in chemical oceanography and marine carbonate chemistry in the Arctic. Uh, then we have Helen Gurney-Smith, who is a research scientist in the biological effects section of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And she specializes in biological effects and climate change on many marine organisms. Um, but one of her primary focuses at the moment are lobsters in the Atlantic, but she also has expertise in shellfish in Pacific regions as well. Then there's myself. I am a postdoc in Brent's lab at the University of Calgary, and my role is to be the um, Neopar coordinator for the community of practice. And my specialization, my background is in paleoecology and understanding how ocean acidification affects um, shelly organisms in relation to their predators. Oops, my apologies. Go back. Hopefully. Sorry, my computer's a little slow this morning. Um, so yeah, then we have a really wide diversity of expertise in our steering committee. So we have Piero Colosi, who is a professor at the University of Quebec, and he specializes in invertebrate physiology, life history responses and adaptation potential in the context of ocean acidification, as well as global change. Kamiko Azuto Scott, is a research scientist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography with Fisheries and Oceans, so DFO. She's also an adjunct at Dalhousie University and she specializes in climate change and carbon cycles in the ocean as well as OA in the North Atlantic and the Arctic. On the other coast, uh, uh, we have Wiley Evans, 
who is a research scientist and the OA lab manager at the Hakai Institute in British Columbia. And he specializes in ocean chemistry and he's an important member of international ocean monitoring efforts in both BC and the North Pacific. Uh, we then have Denise Joy, who is the manager of ocean and climate change science with DFO. And she co-leads the joint DFO and NOAA ocean acidification working group. So really important leadership uh, and connection with our uh, associates in the US. Um, Jim Russell is the executive director of the BC Shellfish Growers Association and uh, brings a lot of industry expertise. He's been a thin fish and shellfish farmer for many, many years. Um, he's a shellfish biologist or has been a shellfish biologist, uh, director of aquaculture and a director of strategic seafood initiatives for the province of British Columbia. And then later last year, um, we created a student representative position on our steering committee to have that early career voice um, on their steering committee. And so our student representative is Patrick Duke, who is a PhD student at the University of Victoria with Roberta Hamm and Debbie Edenson as part of Canada's marine carbon cohort. And his specializations include ocean acidification sensors, as well as air sea carbon fluxes in both the Arctic and the Northeast Pacific. So you can see we have a pretty wide uh, range of expertise and background that we hope to have a really nice well-rounded uh, steering committee to guide and lead our um, activities. So one of the first things that we did as a community of practice was to create a website. So this is basically where we hold all of our main resources. So this is still the go-to place. Um, for finding all the information. So this was very much a large undertaking to create a website from scratch. So you can find us at oceanacidification.ca. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing about uh, updates and new things we're trying with our website. But um, this website is really, really helpful. And this is our main source of information for our community. So if you're looking for any kind of resources, this is probably a good bet to go as a first pass. One of the other things that we did was to join the larger global community uh, concerned about ocean acidification was to join the OA Info Exchange um, and create uh, Team Canada. So within, if anyone has tried the Ocean Acidification Info Exchange, I highly recommend it. It's a great place to have discussions and you can join any team you want, whether it's uh, broken down by topic or by region. Um, you can pretty much guarantee that if you have a question, it'll be answered on that forum. But you can also contribute to the discussions as well. So uh, Team Canada, we do a, a bunch of updates there for uh, Canadian specific issues, but then it's really nice to be able to communicate and have that larger conversation um, with an international audience as well. So this is a great uh, forum for having discussion and starting conversations about different um, OA issues across the world. We're also involved with the GOAN North American Regional Hub. So GOAN is the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And so our role um, within the North American Hub is to act as the Canadian leads. And the goals of GOAN align very well and very much with um, the ocean acidification COP goals. So these include documenting and monitoring OA, understanding impacts of OA, particularly biological responses, and then as well, capacity building and collaborations, particularly within um, countries in North America. And so far, some of the outcomes, there's been two meetings for uh, the North American Regional Hub, and some of the outcomes have been increased collaborations between the three countries, um, as well as um, particularly collaborations between DFO and NOAA. Um, so there's these joint working groups that I mentioned before um, that meet and discuss shared issues and shared research ideas. And there's been great discussions of biological responses as well and how to measure best measure those and capture those biological responses. Um, some other really great outcomes so far have been um, measuring and monitoring efforts for OA in the North Pacific and the Arctic. And there's been some great research that's come out. So I'll just touch on, highlight that uh, one paper here. That's my cat, ignore her. Um, 
So one other thing that we did, you know, we are a community, so we have to build a membership and we have to build a community. So the first thing that was done was that we um, invited people. So we just contacted people that we thought, you know, hey, you look like you're doing um, ocean acidification research or, hey, you, this might be a concern for you in your aquaculture operations. So we invited a bunch of people to join our community of practice to be members. And one of the ways that we keep our members informed is a quarterly newsletter that we put out. So um, every four months, we just put one out this month in March. We'll update them with community activities, new resources, upcoming webinars, that sort of thing. So this is one of our main resources that members can expect to receive. Um, in terms of past activities that we've done so far, um, there have been two workshops that were held. The first was held in conjunction with Neopar's annual scientific meeting um, in 2019, where there was a workshop held in the afternoon after the meeting on ocean acidification in Canada. And so we heard a lot of great summaries from government on OA monitoring um, and assessment in the Arctic, instrument development for OA sensors, uh, things like developing industry partnerships for OA research and um, developing working towards solutions for coastal communities and stakeholders and strategies surrounding that. Um, and then there was a second uh, webinar that, or sorry, workshop that was held in British Columbia. So this was one of our more regional activities, um, which was the Bain Sound Environmental Intelligence Collaborative Workshop. And um, this workshop was really great because it allowed us to bring together those end users and creators of OA data. So basically we had half scientists attending and half industry and stakeholder uh, partners attending. And so some of the issues discussed were things like summer mortality in shellfish. And um, the goals were to better share and communicate some of the scientific research that's being done. So things like oceanographic patterns, estimating current and future marine carbon dioxide and drivers of things like infectious diseases and experimental work that's being done on ocean acidification in shellfish species, particularly um, relevant species like oysters. And so this was a really great way to communicate between these two different groups and share these, um, these concerns about OA. Um, and then finally, uh, we hosted a webinar last year um, by Patrick Duke, um, where he discussed some of the latest developments in ocean acidification sensors. So this is a really great resource. We've put it up on our website now. Um, but this webinar, basically, he goes through and he talks some of the pros and cons of the different sensors that are out there, um, including things like instrument drift and accuracy, um, sensor capabilities, uh, maybe considering things like length of deployment as well as price points. So it's a really good resource if you are trying to develop an OA project or monitor ocean acidification, this is a good resource to check out and learn a little bit more about some of the sensors that are available right now. Other activities that were done in the past include building a catalog of research and infrastructure. So this basically was allowing us to develop a list of resources for who's doing what and where, so that you as an end user can go in and see what might be happening in your area. You can get a quick snapshot of the projects that are happening, as well as contact information for the scientists who are maybe working on that project. So this is really, really useful resource. We've changed the catalog slightly and I'll talk about um, what we've done. We've sort of pivoted it into a new program, but all of the catalog items are still available. Um, and yeah, so this is a really great resource that we're working on building. And I just also wanna mention that we are not the only OA activities that are being funded by Neopar. Um, there are some other research projects that are being funded by Neopar. So I just thought I'd touch on these briefly. There's the Canadian Ocean Acidification Research Project, as well as the Integrated Coastal Acidification Program and um, Observing and Responding to Pressures on Arctic Marine Ecosystems uh, led by Brent. So if you're interested in any of these research projects, I would highly recommend checking out the Neopar website, neopar.ca, to learn a little bit more. And if you want a little bit more information, you can contact me as well, and I can hopefully liaise a little, and I'll put all my contact information up at the end.
All right, so now I just want to talk about a few new activities and new things that we are trying for the community of practice now in 2021. Um, so this past year, as everyone knows, has been very, very interesting. And it's been a great chance to kind of pause and reflect with COVID sort of changing how we work on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, we're two and a half, three years in at this point, and we're trying to think of new ways in this COVID era that we can potentially engage our members. So uh, some of our goals from this point forward are to increase awareness and engagement, to grow our audience, and really basically identify knowledge gaps in areas for knowledge mobilization. You know, that's really, really important for addressing things like OA. And so taking advantage of COVID and this fact that we're really used to getting online resources and information, one of our goals is also to create and enhance our online resources and content that's available for our community. So these are some of the things that I'm going to touch on for the rest of the talk here um, that all kind of yeah revolve around building our online resources. Um, so the first thing that I'll touch on is um, our map of Canada's ocean acidification resources. So we launched this in January to celebrate Ocean Acidification Day of Action, which is January 8th, so 8.1, which is the current pH of our oceans. Um, but this resource is really great. It allows us to have um, all of our, this is what has happened to our catalog of research and infrastructure. So all of those items are still there and it allows us to keep everything up to date a little bit more. And it's a nice geographic spread to see who's doing what, where still. So you can go on and you can search this map. You can look for projects, people, uh, facilities and infrastructure as well. So I'll just show you what this map looks like. So here's our map. Um, we actually, since then, I've added a few more pins, um, but basically it's using Google Maps because that's a tool that's familiar and accessible for most people. So you can go onto the map and you can click through all the different pins. Um, you can also, we've got them split into categories so you can select and unselect the categories. It's particularly in coastal areas, there's a lot of overlapping pins in these areas. So some of them are not even visible at the moment. Um, and so, you basically, if you live in a certain area, you can, you can see what's happening near you. Um, the other thing too, is that if you click on a pin, what will happen is it'll bring up a large description of that pin. So there'll be a, tighter, a title for that pin, but then there'll be a description that includes a link that has an up-to-date uh, list of all the resources that we've gathered for that particular item. And then there'll be a long list of keywords. And this long list of keywords basically allows you to search the map. So there's a search function here. So you can type in something like oysters and it'll bring up every single pin that we have that has oyster as a keyword uh, tagged. So a uh, really useful resource that we're constantly updating. And if you have anything that you wanna add to this map, please let me know. Again, I'll put my contact information up in a second here. Um, but yeah, this is constantly being updated and we're really excited about having some more resources and building resources for um, our map. One other thing I'll touch on too is our new blog series that we've created. This is to help build our resources, add to that map and really increase that awareness engagement. So we have four new blog series that we are um, testing out and trying. They're really um, exciting. Uh, and there's been some cool content coming out and a lot more to come. So I'll just touch on their four different blogs that we're working on. So the first is OA News You Could Use. And so I do this once a week on Thursdays, I'll release a post that has three to five news items. And so the goal here is that it's a service we provide for the community. So you can, every Thursday morning, you can pull out your phone and look and see what's new in terms of OA both in Canada and beyond that week. So I typically like to include things like upcoming events, um, if there's, yeah, webinars or something that's happening. If there's been an OA related news item, especially a Canadian news item, I will try and include those. If there's new educational resources, um, upcoming events from across the world. And then I always like to try and include a new paper. So if there's been new research that's come out, I will include that as well. So it provides kind of a nice uh, update of what's happening in terms of OA in both Canada and beyond. 
And the main goal with this is to not only provide a service for our community, but then have a way for people to link into our website and then explore all of our other resources. So this is a great way to introduce people to our website. Um, one of our other blog posts that we're doing is called Scientist Spotlights. And we try and do these about once a month where we interview a researcher and ask them questions about their research in relation to ocean acidification. Um, and our target group is mostly early career researchers because we want this to be mutually beneficial for both our community as well as you as the researcher, the contributor. Um, so we explore things like your background in research in ocean acidification, as well as get more of a conversation happening about why does ocean acidification matter to you? What do you think all Canadians should know about ocean acidification? So it's a really nice kind of more informal conversational piece to learn about uh, people's research and interests in OA across the country. We also have a similar blog post that we do called Research Recaps, which again is about once a month and I try and target early career researchers as much as possible. Um, the difference here is that this is usually focused on a particular research product, so say a new paper, um, where we interview and kind of peel back the curtain and get a sneak peek on the inside scoop in plain accessible language, uh, how the scientific process works and how this research product came to be. Um, so again, it's a really nice way to have this conversation and have a more informal conversational way of learning about people's research and the, the contributions that they're making to our knowledge of OA across the country. Our final blog post that we're trying out is Meet the COP. So this again is very much like scientist spotlights where you get to learn a little bit more about the um, research that's happening across the country, but specifically we target for these ones, our leadership team. So not only get to, do you get to learn about the background of our leadership team and why they're interested in ocean acidification, um, but it's really inspiring because uh, we get to learn about why they chose to lead the COP and why the COP matters for Canadians. So it's a really great way to learn about why we're doing what we're doing and as well as learning about the research that people are trying and doing across the country. Um, so yeah, this is their steering committee and our co-leads. So Brent here, or one of our co-leads, uh, did a live interview with me a few weeks ago. And so it's a, about a 12 minute video. If you want to check it out, it's really um, a really great video, really great conversation. So I just thought I'd put up here some more of our blog posts. It's not just limited to these four. So if you have a cool idea, um, we're more than willing to uh, work with you and have a, a unique piece that we develop as well. So one thing we're doing is we um, had a regional highlight a couple in months ago in January, where we interviewed a few OA researchers at Hakai Institute and learned about some of their interdisciplinary work with respect to ocean acidification. So that's a really interesting piece. And I also just put up here, um, I'm trying to make all these interesting eye-catching graphics for social media purposes um, as a way of trying to engage people and having them click if they see a picture of a person, um, that might be a way of having them engage a little bit more. Um, and like I said, we have a lot more to come. So uh, please check out our website. Yeah, we try and do at least one of these posts per month. So there's usually two to three posts that we do per month. Um, you can find everything on our website, oceanacidification.ca. I will also post updates on the OA Info Exchange too if you join Team Canada. And if you want to be featured, um, we're always looking for new content. Um, I'd love to hear from you for any of these blog posts, or like I said, if you have a unique idea that you want to put forward, I'd love to hear from you. Here's my contact information coordinator at oceanacidification.ca. And I'll put this up on the very last slide as well. So some other things we're doing with our website is that you know it's very much a work in progress. We're working to update it. Um, add new resources all the time. So we're working on building our resources pages and some new static pages and resources as well. So I mentioned we are adding that um, webinar by Patrick Duke on ocean acidification sensors. We've added that. We're working on translating our website into French as well. Um, so we'd appreciate feedback on that as well. But lots of things, very much a work in progress for our website. 
Um, in terms of membership, I just threw this up here. This is a really informal thing. This is not formal in any means, um, but I just wanted to show you some of the affiliations and the stakeholder groups that do make up our current um, membership list. So this is just, I was looking at primary affiliation. So you can see we have large uh, voices from government, academia, as well as industry, but we also have a lot of members from ocean acidification groups abroad. So we have that global connection. Um, from NGO groups, students as well, MIOPAR representatives, and then we have a few um, industry, or sorry, indigenous community um, leaders as well that join our uh, membership list. And something else that we have tried now is we've created a new membership list. So this allows members to have a little bit more control over what they're receiving and what email address they're choosing. Um, as well to it's allowing us to capture new members that we might not have been um, seeing they might not have been on our radar so um, yeah people can add themselves now to our membership list so this is really great for us to have a chance for people to reach out to us and to join our community as well so we've captured quite a few new members that way as well um, I'll just touch really briefly on social media. So since October, we've been trying to engage a little bit more online to see if that's a great way or to see if it's a viable way to make connections and um, have more engagement of our community and growth of our community. And so you can see our three membership lists. Um, Facebook basically has stayed the same since October. We see very low engagement there. Um, our Instagram following has increased quite a bit. We're over 115 followers at the moment, and we see a lot of engagement on our posts, but not a lot of traffic to our website. So I find that really interesting. And then um, finally, our Twitter account, you can see our following has, has tripled since October. And this is where we see probably the most, um, not necessarily engagement likes on our posts or shares on our posts, but this is where a lot of our web traffic is coming from. So Twitter comprises, I think it's the third or fourth uh, most uh, important source of traffic to our website. So clearly people are clicking on our links that we share to so things like blog post updates. So I thought this was just useful to put up in case other groups have experienced something different or similar. Um, I know I've seen the opposite trends in other groups. So I just think it's always interesting to know where our community comes from and where they're getting, um, where we're getting engagement. All right, so now I'll just touch a little on some things we're planning on doing going forward. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have this coast to coast ocean acidification sensor package that we're hoping to deploy um, this summer, COVID dependent. Um, but basically we're building partnerships with aquaculture operators. And the goal of these sensor packages is that we go and put them out in the water. And it's a means of allowing aquaculture operators to determine and predict ocean acidification impacts on their crops. Um, and so this aligns, of course, with our goals as a community of practice to help facilitate um, those conversations and that sharing of resource, as well as allowing us to contribute, hopefully, to larger global monitoring efforts as well. And one of the other goals with this sensor package is that we want to compare sensor performance. So we actually have two kinds of sensors that we're hoping to um, fund and deploy here. So there is really nice existing sensors that are very, very expensive. So that might be really cost prohibitive for individual operators, but there's some newer lower cost sensors that we don't necessarily know the accuracy of yet. So the idea with having both sensors is that we allows us to compare the performance and see if maybe some of these newer, cheaper sensors are more viable for individual aquaculture operators. So we're hoping to get this in the water and test it out. Uh, this summer, we also hopefully have an engineering summer student that's going to be joining us um, to work on developing some wireless communication for these sensor packages. So this is great for both allowing us to um, help out industry members, but also hopefully contribute to broader ocean acidification monitoring efforts. As well, we're working on some vulnerability assessments. So these are species and community assessments. And the idea here is that we're hopefully going to be incorporating both or all of biological, physical, and socioeconomic indicators within these assessments. 
And the goals here being that we really want to facilitate regional priorities and action plans. So this is really helpful for policymakers, for example, um, and provide basically a bunch of information on how uh, vulnerable these different aspects are to things like ocean acidification. The other thing too, is that we're really benefiting from collaborations between DFO and NOAA. So there's a lot of shared resources and research happening here because of course we have shared regions and common species of interests. Uh, so this is really beneficial to have these um, resources that are being shared between Canada and the US in terms of these vulnerability assessments. And I'd just like to plug here that there are hopefully some upcoming workshops happening from being hosted uh, and put on by the Ocean Acidification Alliance. So this is the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. So I think that these um, workshops are gonna be really useful for scientists in particular, because they're gonna walk us through how we do a vulnerability assessment and have it more from the policymaker side of things. So I think it'll be a really useful resource. So uh, stay tuned for updates about that, uh, those workshops. So briefly, just a few other ongoing activities that we're planning on doing. Um, I'm actively inviting new members. So uh, seeking out people and sending personalized invitations, hoping that um, people join our community. Uh, we're also building a database of both resources and people and collecting a bunch of metadata that's hopefully going to go into a paper that's an overview of the community of practice in the state of OA knowledge in Canada. Um, Hopefully we're gonna get back to workshops after uh, COVID here, but I would just also like to plug that we have a webinar happening on April 14th by Kristen Rutherford, who is a PhD candidate at Dalhousie. And um, she's gonna be telling us about, uh, the talk is called Source or Sink, um, a numeric modeling study of inorganic carbon fluxes on the Scotian shelf. So I think that'll be really useful and really interesting for people. So please join us on April 14th for that. Um, and you can find, again, all of this information on our website. Um, one last thing is we're hoping to continue collaborations with these international global groups um, that are related to ocean acidification. So in particular, things like the OA Info Exchange, the OA Alliance, and go on as well. So hoping to continue and build those partnerships um, and broaden our uh, perspectives not and bring Canadian OA research to uh, the world. And with that, I would just like to thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Um, I have time to acknowledge as well um, all of our past and current members of our steering committee who helped and give guidance for all of our activities and for this presentation. A huge shout out to our co-leads Brent and Helen. Um, as well as to our membership, our community, and all the people who have contributed to our blog or to our resources. And uh, thanks to our funders, Miopar, the University of Calgary, and DFO. And finally, a huge thanks to Allison and Bridget and everyone at Miopar. And thank you very much for your time and for listening. And with that, I'm just going to put up a slide that's got all of our contact information. And if there's time, I will take any questions. There is one question already in the Q&A, Christina. Um, have there been attempts to engage more with OA social science researchers? And that comes from David. Oh, that is a great question. That's something that we're very much aware of that is kind of a, um, a gap we're hoping to fill a little bit more. I don't have any concrete information at this time, but I can tell you that, yes, it's very much a concern that we are aware of and we are working towards improving. Hopefully that answered your question. And if anyone else has questions, feel free because we do have, you know, 10 minutes left. Oh, I was going to drop that link in the chat as well. Um, Oh, it looks like someone raised their hand.
Yeah, so um, I see Helen, who is one of our co-leads, um, answered David's question in um, the chat box a little bit with a little bit more specific information. So she says, we did have a social scientist on our steering committee, but they had other competing responsibilities. So we're looking into other options to fill that position with another social scientist. And we hope that that will help with engagement for those groups. So yeah, um, stay tuned for more information there. Uh, there's another question in the chat. So what type of research and collaborations are there between OA researchers and government policy folks? And that comes from Angela uh, in Vancouver. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, OA researchers and government policy folks. Uh, so I will say that um, the OA Alliance has done quite a bit, has taken the lead on quite a bit of this stuff. Um, so we do, the OA Alliance has act, OA action plans that they offer for cities and different levels of governance um, that it is welcome for any city or organization to join as well. And there are a few cities and groups within Canada that have joined and created these OA action plans. So I would say that we're working on some partnerships there with the um, OA Alliance to, to have these collaborations. So um, they're a great group and a great resource for us to share and to uh, partner with. So if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about some of these OA action plans and what we can do to have these collaborations, um, I, uh, yeah, you can reach out to me at coordinator at oceanacidification.ca and um, yeah, we can start a conversation with the OA Alliance. So hopefully that answers some of the questions there. Yes, and I see, uh, yeah, Vancouver is a member of the OA Alliance, yeah. Um, and yeah, it would be great to chat a little bit more. Again, that, that's part of our role as a community of practice is to facilitate these conversations. So I'd be happy to chat um, with you, Angela. Um, oh, hello, Chris. Thank you for tuning in. Um, yes, we do look forward to continuing collaborations with NOAA and DFO. If anyone has any further questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. But Christina, you must have done a great job with your presentation <laughs> if there are no other questions. Hopefully. I will take a minute to shout out uh, the OA COP for, um, I, I just love your communication efforts and, and the effort that you put into to, you know, telling stories and, and to having kind of that strong social media presence. Um, I think it's it's really awesome and it's yeah it make it always makes me want to read more the way you communicate so awesome well done yeah we appreciate that yeah it seems like twitter is a good place to grow our audience and so yeah we're hoping to continue and just try new things um <laughs> yeah it's great okay well if there are Oh, and yeah, Helen says, and I completely agree with this, that we would love to hear more from you as the attendees about how you think um, we can effectively engage in what you need from us. So yes, very much. We are a service. We are here to help. So yeah, if you have any ideas, if you don't feel comfortable sharing them here, you can always give me an email. Okay, and if there aren't any other um, questions from the crowd, I'll just take the opportunity to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and thank Christina for the presentation. It was great. Um, and I'll just encourage everyone to keep an eye on our website, neopar.ca for upcoming webinars. Um, 
from the communities of practice and also from our training program. Uh, always have lots of stuff going on. So, so keep, keep tabs on us for sure. Um, thank you, Christina. Thank you.